So we've added government to our circular flow model. Now it's time to add the foreign sector. But look, this box is labeled W, not F for foreign sector. Well, obviously we already have a F box. So we need to call this box something else other than F. So we'll use W and let that stand for the rest of the world. We'll label the flow from the household to the rest of the world, purchases of imports. An import is a good or service that is purchased by an American household from a foreign country. Technically, firms also purchase goods and services from foreign countries as well. But in an effort to keep our model as simple and comprehensible as possible, we'll only show the households purchasing imports here. It's labeled in red because it shows a leakage of spending from the American economy, which would cause it to slow down. It's also an injection of spending into some foreign country's economy, which would cause that country's economy to speed up. The purchase of imports flow consists entirely of money. Virtually every country in the world accepts dollars. It's the world's reserve currency. That is, commodities such as gold, silver, petroleum, and other resources are priced in the reserve currency. And the world has agreed upon having the dollar as the world's reserve currency. So, large banks and other financial institutions in other countries hold large amounts of this currency for international transactions such as the purchases of goods and services, international investments, and international debt obligations. Usually, there's no need for importers in the U.S. to exchange dollars, the world's reserve currency, for some other country's currency in order to buy foreign goods. If, however, there was some country that did not accept dollars, the American buyer of the foreign good would have to take his dollars to the foreign exchange market and there trade his dollars for the required currency. Currencies are bought and sold on foreign exchange markets, just like stocks on the stock market. And, just like stocks, the value of a country's currency, in terms of some other country's currency, is determined by supply and demand. The price of one country's currency, in terms of some other country's currency, is known as the exchange rate. When the price of a dollar goes up on international currency markets, in terms of some other country's currency, it is said that the dollar has strengthened. Suppose, for example, that the price of a dollar goes up in terms of the Japanese yen on international currency markets. It would take more yen to buy a dollar, and we would say that the dollar has strengthened against the yen. Because it would now take more yen to buy an American product, Japanese consumers would buy less from America. On the other hand, if the dollar becomes cheaper in terms of some other country's currency, it is said to have weakened against that currency. Suppose for some reason it now takes fewer euros to buy a dollar on international currency markets. We would say that the dollar has weakened against the euro. A weaker dollar means that a euro can now buy more dollars. Thus, the cost of buying American products would be lower to those countries in the eurozone, and as a result, they'd buy more American goods and services. The American consumer, wishing to purchase a foreign good, would want the dollar to be as strong as possible. This would make foreign goods cheaper for the American consumer. As a result, they might be inclined to buy a Mercedes rather than a Chevy, or a Samsung rather than an Apple. Of course, American firms wouldn't like this at all. They would want the dollar to be weaker. The cost of buying their product would fall for foreign customers, but the cost of buying their product wouldn't change at all for Americans. The flow from the rest of the world to the household is labeled delivery of imports. This is the actual physical goods being delivered to American ports. At this moment, 
there are hundreds of cargo ships sitting idle, waiting for an opportunity to unload their containers full of goods at American ports. We are currently experiencing supply chain issues that are delaying the offloading of these foreign products. The United States of America is the world's largest importer importing more goods and services from Mexico and Canada than from any other country. Next is China, Japan, Germany, and South Korea in that order. The flow from the rest of the world to the American firm is labeled purchases of exports. This represents foreign countries buying goods and services from America. This flow consists entirely of money. Other countries must convert their currencies into dollars in order to buy American goods. We will label this flow in green to indicate that it represents an injection of spending into the American economic system, which will cause it to speed up. America is the world's second largest exporter, exceeded only by China. And the flow from the American firm to the rest of the world we can label delivery of exports. These are the actual goods and services going to other countries. The relationship between purchases of imports and purchases of exports is known as the U.S. balance of international trade, or usually just referred to as the balance of trade. The word international is implicit. A balance of trade surplus would mean that the purchases of exports exceed the purchases of imports. In other words, more spending is flowing into the American economy than flowing out to other countries. Because there is a net injection of spending into the economy, the economy will speed up, ceteris paribus. A balance of trade deficit, on the other hand, would mean that there was a net leakage of spending from the economy because the purchases of imports exceeded the purchases of exports. This would cause the economy to slow down. As of October, the U.S. balance of trade for 2021 has a deficit of $67.1 billion. In fact, the U.S. economy usually does run a balance of trade deficit. The last balance of trade surplus was in 1975. So now let's consider the following question. Why does the U.S. trade with other countries? The U.S. sells goods and services to other countries because American firms like to sell things. It doesn't matter to whom. American products are often much superior in quality to the products made in other countries. American firms tend to be more innovative and in most cases have a definite technological edge over other countries. American firms also tend to be more efficient, able to produce products at a lower cost and thus sell them for a lower price. Even when considering the shipping costs, it's often, but not always, cheaper to buy American. But the U.S. also buys goods and services from other countries for a variety of reasons. First, in some cases, foreign countries can produce things more cheaply than American firms. This is particularly the case with labor-intensive industries, that is, those that use more labor than capital, such as clothing and shoe manufacturing. In some cases, the U.S. lacks the resources, which may be abundant in other countries, to produce particular goods and services. For example, until 2008, the U.S. had to import almost all of its petroleum. The U.S. also has to import goods that require these so-called rare earth minerals. The opportunity costs of producing some goods or services in the U.S. might be too high. Even though the U.S. might do a better job of producing a good or service, the opportunity cost of the resources required to produce that good or service might be too high and can be used more productively somewhere else. Even though the U.S. might have an absolute advantage in the production of some good or service, that is, can do a better job of producing it, the country that can produce it with the lower opportunity cost would have the comparative advantage. 
by allowing the country that has the comparative advantage to produce that good or service would result in a better allocation of resources. The opportunity cost of call center workers in India, for example, is lower than that in the U.S., where workers have an opportunity to be much more productive. India, therefore, would have the comparative advantage in call center services. So there we've added the foreign sector to our circular flow model. Now we have one more sector left to add, and we'll be doing that next, and that is the financial sector.